without the blood, I would be holding on to nothing. Without the blood of my Jesus. So, Father, um, that's kind of a freaky song um, about blood. Or maybe it's an absolutely wonderful song. I guess that depends on, Father, whether you are a blood taker or a blood giver. Are you bloodthirsty or a blood donor? Lord God, I pray that um, you would help us to preach the blood and believe your word and be animated by your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, this is our uh, fifth sermon from 1 Peter. Um, by the way, that's the best name for a book in the Bible, 1 Peter. Uh, and in this sermon, I'd like to look at the same verses that we looked at uh, last time uh, when we talked about the the war in the Middle East and a, a paradigm shift regarding the Temple Mount and the Dome of the Rock Mosque. According to Peter, the temple is actually your neighbor and Jesus is the rock. We ended the sermon with the story about the death of my old friend Brad and a quick discussion of the last verse that we read that morning. 1 Peter 2.12 Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers or wrongdoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify, doxazo, worship. Praise God on the day of visitation. Now, if you think about that for a minute, you'll realize that that is just a weird thing for Peter to say or for Peter to write. In the previous sentence, he urges the recipients of the letter to abstain from the passions, same word as lust, the lusts of the flesh. And so we naturally think, you know, that's sex and alcohol and stuff like that. But then why would abstaining from that make those that speak against us as wrongdoers suddenly start praising God for our good day, deeds on, on judgment day or any day that Jesus happens to visit? The day of visitation. Remember that when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and everybody's screaming Hosanna to the King of Kings and all that stuff, Jesus started weeping over the city, Jerusalem, because she did not know the time of her visitation. And then he says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so in old Jerusalem, they call out king of kings, but they don't recognize him. And they would not see him again until they would say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. If you went to Jerusalem in the name of the Lord, would people look at you and, 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 and say that? Blessed, blessed are you who come in. The, what would make them say that? If you read scripture carefully, I think you'll discover that although Jesus judges no one, as he says in John 8, 15, and although the Father judges no one, as he says in John 5, 22, for all judgment has been given to the Son, <clears throat> I think you'll discover that Jesus is the judgment. This is the judgment, says Jesus in John three nineteen. The light has come into the world, and, and what is the light? I am the light of the world, says Jesus. 1 Peter 4.13, Peter is going to write, Rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. 2 Timothy 4.1, Paul writes, just before he's executed, um, he, he, he writes this and he seems to be saying that the world is going to be judged simply by his appearing. Jesus appearing. In 4.8, he, he writes, There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing. That would be the first appearing. 
First John 2, 2, 28, John writes this, and now little children abide in him, remain in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his parousia. That's his effective presence, the manifestation of his coming. You see, there's going to come a day, a time, or a moment when Jesus will appear to you. Like he appeared to Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration. Like he appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. Like he appeared to John on the island of Patmos. Remember when John dropped as if he were dead at the revelation of Jesus. He's going to uh, appear to you. And suddenly on that day you will realize that um, you've seen him countless times before. For he is the love and the logos that animates all things. He's appeared to you countless times before, even in and especially in the last and the least of these, his brothers, who also includes you, one of them being you, and whatever you did to them, you in fact did it to him. So suddenly you'll realize that you have crucified this man standing on the throne of God, shining like the sun. You've crucified him with every self-centered, arrogant thought you've ever thunk. This is the judgment. Sorry, I'm yelling. But it's the revelation of Jesus. If you trust him, you will go to him and enter his kingdom. If you hide from him, well, the only place to hide is hell. And even then, you can only hide for a time. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light, said Jesus. So this is our question. Okay, so this is the question. What deeds could you do now that would cause your enemies to break out in spontaneous worship to God on that day? Or spin it around. If you died right now, and then suddenly you saw Jesus standing on the throne of God, shining like the sun, and you recognized him, the one that you had maligned and tormented countless times, and he looked like this, would you suddenly break out in spontaneous praise to God? Or if he looked like this, and you were a Palestinian, would you just suddenly start praising God? Or if he looked like this, and you didn't vote for him, would you just suddenly start praising God? Or if he looked like this, Joe Biden, would you suddenly start praising God? What if he looked like this? Jerry Falwell founded the Moral Majority. And he seemed to preach that if you were in the moral majority, you would be endlessly blessed. But if you were not in the moral majority, you would be endlessly and hopelessly cursed, as if the majority were ever moral. But anyway, that's something he's, he said. But, or what if you look like this? Billy Graham. I think Billy Graham was a much better preacher than Jerry Falwell, and by the end of his life, he preached something rather different than he had before. But for most of his life, most people seem to think that he was saying that if you didn't say the prayer at the end of his message, before your body died, God would despise you and torture you endlessly without mercy. That is, love could not and would not love you, ever. Well, let's just say that you didn't say the prayer at the end of the message and Jesus looked just like Billy on that day. Would you break out in spontaneous songs of praise offered up to God? What if he looked like this? Well, that might be different, huh? 
I read a wonderful little account of a militant atheist who spoke of Mother Teresa as a wrongdoer until he went to her home for the dying and he just happened to watch one of her nuns. Unbeknownst to this nun, he watched her tenderly care for this man that she had found dying in the gutter, his back absolutely covered with worms. And at the end of the day, he said to Mother Teresa, I came here today not believing in God. With my heart full of hate, but now I'm leaving here believing in God because I've seen love. He recognized the time of his visitation and he said, blessed is she who comes in the name of the Lord. Yeshua, God is salvation. But, but now listen, Mother Teresa's dead. Don't know if you knew that, but she's dead. A lot of nuns, preachers, and religious folks, they're just pretending to love. Why? Well, to get into heaven. What if on that day he looked like this? Now, um, this probably doesn't mean anything to you, but it means everything to you. Because that's my dad. And I watched him for 42 years. And I came to know this about my dad. I could disobey him. I could talk back to him. I could defame him. I could really hurt him. And he would discipline me. Sometimes rather severely, in, in my mind at least, painfully anyway. But he would never, ever, ever, ever stop Loving me. In fact, the most painful discipline for me was watching him bleed for me. It was knowing that I had hurt him and that he would never ever stop forgiving me. Not because he had to, but because he wanted to. And you see, it wasn't just like one giant heroic act. It was the way he looked at me, the way he reacted to me, uh, the little things, you know, that a person cannot control, the things that flow from the sanctuary of the soul. He wasn't perfect. He, he was perishable uh, dust of this world. But he was also something imperishable, from another world that would be revealed through the cracks in his earthen vessel, particularly the cracks that had been caused by me, wounding him. When people ask, why do you believe? I can talk apologetics. I can tell some amazing, miraculous stories. I can exegete every text. But I think at the end of the day, why do I really believe? I think I met Jesus in my dad. You may have had a terrible dad, but you have the very best heavenly father, and he will visit you. I'm sure he already has, and even if you die without recognizing him, he won't stop. For his word even descends into the depths of the earth where he sets captives free. So, back to our question, right? What are the beautiful deeds that you might do that would make your enemies burst into praise on the day of visitation? Well, maybe you could give them your cloak. If they had already taken your tunic. Or maybe you could turn the other cheek once they had already punched you in the face. In other words, you could forgive them. Not as an act, but because it had become your nature. In other words, you could love them unconditionally. Blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness sake. You, persecuted for righteousness sake, are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they will give glory to your Father in heaven, says Jesus the Son. So what's Peter expecting here? I think he's expecting us to bleed for our enemies. Not because we have to, but because we want to. You know, like sincerely and from the heart. 
And so we should ask, how on earth, are, how on earth, how, how are we going to do that? When you really see what that is, it's, it's impossible, it's illogical, it's an illusion. It's just not how life works on this planet. Whenever scripture seems absurd, I find it helpful to take it more literally. And by literally, I don't mean what most people mean by literally. By literally, most people mean according to our concepts of space and time. In which case, scripture literally says that we cannot take anything literally for our concepts of space and time are an illusion and matter doesn't really matter. At least not in the way that you think it matters. So, by, by literally... I mean according to the author's original intent. And for that, it's helpful to translate literally and then ask, what was the author's original intent? Rather than assuming we know the author's original intent before we really give it a, a good read. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, so put away. And you see, I'm sorry to do this right at the start. But literally translated, he doesn't say put away in the imperative tense. He writes, having put away, which is an heiress middle participle. Why does that matter? Well, because Peter isn't prescribing something that he's commanding us to do. He's describing something that in his mind he thinks has already happened. It's already been done. So what's already been done? Well, this is why it's important to read a whole letter. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3, we've been born again, begotten again, or from above to a living hope. Verse 13, therefore having girded up the loins of your mind, that's a paradigm shift, set your hope fully on the grace that is being brought to you in Jesus. Verse 23, you've been born again, born from above, begotten from above, of imperishable spora by the living and abiding logos, the word of God, which is the sperma of God, Jesus and the good news that was preached to you. See, we assume Mises, me is salvation, or Weezes, we is salvation, but Peter's testifying to Jesus. God is salvation. Now our verse. Having put away apothemenoi, something like that, literally, literally having taken off, having undressed, or having been undressed of all deceit. That's every lie. So if you think that you have undressed yourself of every lie, you're lying to yourself. Having been undressed of all deceit and hypocrisy, that's pretending or acting. Having been undressed of all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. How did we ever get dressed in all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, and all slander? Did God dress us? No. It was our choice. We took the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, attempting to make ourselves like God. But when we saw that we were naked, we began to hide from God by clothing ourselves in what? Deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. We wrapped ourselves in fig leaves. Why? To hide from whom? Our helper. Our husband. Who actually desires to close us with him, with himself. He is our righteousness. That's not our choice. That's his choice. When Peter or Paul speak about human flesh, they're speaking of the thing that we make by eating life and pooping death. That is trying to win by making others lose. In this world, we call it growing up. But in reality, it's trapping ourselves in a prison often referred to as the human ego. So I dress myself. But how do I get undressed? I can't really undress myself with myself. That's more self. You see, it happens at the cross. It happens when I return to the tree and what I, I'm circumcised. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm stripped of my ego. I'm undressed. We think it's death, but it's the death of death, which is the beginning of life. And that's good news. For you can only enter the kingdom as a child. Verse 2. As, not just like, but 
as newborn infants long for the pure logikos milk. Translated spiritual. But the meaning is, is actually really clear. Logikos means logical. But maybe we translate it as spiritual because nursing doesn't seem logical to us because we think we're already grown up. I don't know, but spiritual is logical in Scripture because Jesus is the logos. As newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. Notice that Peter just pointed out that we're not saved. And yet there is an imperishable seed in each one of us that cannot be destroyed. We're not saved, but we need to grow up into Maybe he means that literally. Into salvation? That by the pure logical milk you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is kind. It's his kindness, writes Paul, that leads us to repentance. Repentance, remember, is a gestalt shift of like just epic proportions, massive gestalt shifts can happen in a moment but must be nurtured over time. Why? Well, because we live in a world of constant lies, a river of lies. So why do you come to worship? I hope it's to come to this table at the foot of this tree and taste that the Lord is kind. Verse 4, as you come to him, a living stone. And at this point, I think most modern readers kind of check out a living stone. What's a living stone? And, and for that matter, what is life? Susan and I have been watching this great new show on uh, Netflix titled Life on Our Planet. They keep showing all these really cool but now extinct life forms. And you think to yourself, how beautiful and then these life forms attack each other, eat each other, and you think, how awful! Life sucks! This is like hell! And then Morgan Freeman, the voice of God, says something like this. The smile of mammalian cunning was one reason terror birds went extinct. <laughs> Competition both within and between species has always driven evolution. And that's when I turn to say to Susan and I say something like, Morgan Freeman is really pissing me off. <laughs> and please understand that I'm saying this not so much as a pastor, but as a guy who graduated Phi Beta Kappa with a degree in geology from the University of Colorado who believes that the fossil record is filled with evidence for gradual evolution within phylums, and who thinks that the universe is both 13.8 billion years old and six days old, depending upon your perspective, your frame of reference. I'm saying this because competition does not drive evolution. Life drives evolution. But we don't like saying something like that because we really don't know what life is. However, competition is extremely logical to us on our planet. I mean, we know it quite, quite well. Competition shapes life forms, but only in the sense that it limits the direction in which life forms may evolve. So go back to science class for a minute and think with me. If there are a bunch of deer and all the low-hanging fruit gets eaten, then it makes sense that those who inherit genetic material encoding a longer neck might survive while other deer perish and might eventually turn into giraffes. But the evolution of some is not driven by the death of the others. It's driven by the life that has mysteriously animated those bodies of dust such that rather than competing, all these individual cells, they, they start cooperating. According to some mysterious logic, and then together uh, they desire to exist as a giraffe rather than mold 
or a bag of amoebas or dust. And now you may say things like, well, competition made my son a great track athlete. But you know that's not true. Something else made your son a great runner. Probably milk. And Cheerios. Some sacrifice on your part. Some sacrifice on other people's parts. And, and, you, and you know that he enjoyed running. He enjoyed running long before he joined the track team. It's just that when he joined the track team, you introduced a new motive. The desire to run faster than his neighbor. That is to beat his neighbor by making his neighbor lose. But every little child just loves to run. At least until someone says that they have to run in order to be something that they're not. The survival of the fittest is a tautology. In other words, it means actually nothing because the fittest are defined as those that survive and those that survive are defined as the fittest. The far more interesting question is why would anything want to survive? Why would anything want to live? What is life? I've thought about this for most of 62 years now, so I hope you just hear me out. First, let me say, we really don't know what life is, but it's at least these three things in some form that are also a fourth thing. Number one, it's a decision. A choice, which means it's a judgment. It's a decision, but a really bizarre and mysterious decision. It's a decision to sacrifice autonomy for community. So one molecule sacrifices its identity to a second molecule and becomes a third molecule that continues that size sacrifice until they somehow become a cell. And then it's one cell that no longer competes, no longer competes with other cells, but cooperates with other cells. It sacrificed its identity in order to receive a greater identity. For instance, a, a one-celled amoeba is now a slug. Whew, awesome. It's one body part that sacrifices its identity, but does not become less of itself. It actually becomes more of itself. Now, I've shown you this picture, I think, several times, and I've asked you this question. When is a chicken leg most a chicken leg, or more of a chicken leg? When it's attached to the chicken, or when it's sitting on your plate, severed and no longer controlled, no longer enslaved to the chicken? <laughs> To remain attached to the chicken and, and live, you see, the chicken has to constantly lose itself. The chicken leg has to constantly lose itself in order to find itself. In other words, it has to bleed. It has to sacrifice blood in order to receive blood. And scripture says the life, the, the, the ruach, the pneuma, the, the life is in the blood. Life is a decision to sacrifice yourself. If, now listen closely, if that decision is imposed from the outside, well, then it's not life. It's death. But if that decision rises up from the inside, it's not death, but life. In other words, the decision has to be a free decision. And incidentally, with all of our knowledge, all of our scientific knowledge, we are utterly unable to make one little thing live that wasn't living before. That's how incredibly miraculous and mysterious this decision is. And we all have a word for this decision, and the word is love. In this is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and gave his son as an atoning sacrifice Atoning, atoning means at one minute, atoning sacrifice for our sins. Gave his only begotten, which in biblical thought is himself. 
Leviticus 17.20, for the life is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement, which means at one -ment. at one -ment for your souls, for it's the blood that makes atonement, at one -ment for the life. See, God's talking like if in the temple he, he was taking or is taking individual lives and making them one life, even his life. Now, from the outside of that body, that body of life that is the temple, that decision looks like death. But from inside of the body, in the holy place, that decision is actually life itself. It's a heart pumping life through open blood vessels, vessels of mercy. But the moment a vessel refuses to bleed, it becomes a vessel of wrath, for it's what? Damn the life that is the blood. Life is respiration. Life is a communion of sacrifice in freedom, which is called love. So that's number one. Life is love. And number two, life is an organizing principle. I mean by that it's a particular logos. Not, not, not chaos, but logos. In other words, it's not random sacrifice, it's meaningful sacrifice. So, so there's a logic to the sacrifice itself and a logic that controls all the sacrifices simultaneously like a, like a brain or a head. But like love, this logos cannot simply be imposed from the outside, it has to also come from the inside. I mean, every member would have to drink it like, 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 like milk. In other words, to be a part of this life, you'd have to receive it like a child. You'd have to surrender to it like, like music. When you begin to dance, you know, the music is all around you. But the moment you really begin to dance is the moment that you surrender your own logic to the logic that's driving the dance, the music of the dance. And when not only a bunch of body parts in one individual, but all the individuals in a room surrender to the logic of the same dance, then the dance takes on a life all of its own. And you say, wow, I, I love this party. It's like alive. You see, for a moment, it's as if you have reversed the flow of entropy, which is also the flow of time. On our planet, the second law of thermodynamics states that in a closed system, and now this is important, every center is a closed system. On our planet, the second law of thermodynamics states that in a closed system, entropy always increases. In other words, everything dies. And we cannot reverse the flow of time. Kind of. Because sometimes, if two individuals freely surrender to the logic of love, their sacrificial communion can reverse entropy. And we call it a baby. If it's not a free sacrifice of communion, it's rape. And it usually leads to death. But if we freely surrender to the logic of love and a covenant of unconditional love, it's not rape. And we usually refer to it as romance. So number one, life is love, which is a communion of sacrifice and freedom. And number two, life is the logos of love, which is revealed to us as a romance. And number three, life is some sort of consciousness. And if there's anything that just freaks scientists out, it's consciousness. For it appears that consciousness can make choices on a planet that is entirely determined. And not just random choices, but meaningful choices on a planet where everything seems to be determined by chaos. And now, if you are not confused by what I just said, you probably don't understand what I just said. And you need to take a course in philosophy in order to get confused. Consciousness is freaky because it appears to be capable of choice. 
And that's really confusing for us. And it's super confusing for scientists on a very fundamental level, for it seems to be more foundational than space-time. And it appears to matter more than matter. Now, that's incredibly controversial in the science of particle physics, quantum mechanics, and all of that kind of stuff. And yet, we all know it's true. I'm yelling again. Sorry, but I just think this stuff is so fascinating. Your mind, your consciousness can control matter. And the matter that it can control is called your body. When I was an infant, I just was utterly fascinated by that. I do this all day, but now I just take it for granted and I ask stupid questions like, do I exist? Do I matter? Well, this is my point right now. I am very conscious of my own body of flesh, for I can only feel my own pain. And I only feel my own pleasure. And I control, at least for the most part, some of the time, this body of flesh. But not other bodies of flesh. Well, pain is what I feel when the parts of my body are no longer cooperating, but competing, or perhaps severed from the body. And pleasure is what I feel when all the parts are bound together in the freely chosen sacrificial and logical communion called life. And maybe that's why life chooses to survive. For consciousness of life is experienced as joy. And joy is just another word to describe what we all really want. Like what we were made for. What we desire. And now this is the miracle. In certain instances, I can become conscious of and actually feel another person's pleasure. As if we were, for a moment, one body. In my body, each part is conscious of the pleasure of the whole body. Even as all the parts feel the pain when just one is severed. But what if? What if every person that ever existed was all one body? Every person. No longer competing, no longer severed, but all bound in a communion of freely offered self-sacrifice called love. You would feel no pain. And you would feel an absolutely insane, I think even infinite degree of joy. Pleasure ecstasy. So number one, life is love. Number two, life is the logic of love. And number three, life is the spirit of love and logic, which is now filling all things. 1 Corinthians 15, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ, in Christ, literally, let's listen to that again. As in Adam, the old man, all die, so in Christ will all be made alive living, alive. The first Adam became a living nephesh, a soul, a psyche, an individual psyche. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit, pneuma, that is breath, the one consciousness given to all through the sacrifice of himself. And now, back to our verse, 2 Peter 2.4, as you come to him a living stone, You know what this is? This is a dead stone. It's a ground up stone. It's dust. It's my dad's dust. But don't worry. Don't freak out. People freak out when I do this. He's not here. I mean, he's not at least here in, in this dust. And, and believe me, if he had his preference, he, do, he just doesn't want this dust. He wants his 18-year-old dust. This is actually a different bag of dust than when he was 18 years old. I mean, he used to tell me that all the time, a dead stone. So, so what's, a, what's a living stone? Well, it's a bag of dust or a bag of dirt, or you could call it a dirt bag, <laughs> into which God our Father... Um, has breathed his own breath, 
the spirit of love and logos. So, so you could think of it um, kind of like uh, this balloon. This balloon as the dirt bag. And, and we think of life as holding our breath. <gasps> According to scripture, all of Adam, humanity, is like holding our breath. We are all holding the breath. In fact, we even build a stone temple around the bath, breath, which we, which we think protects the breath, but actually becomes a prison for the breath. Uh, all of Adam, humanity, is holding the breath until the last Adam surrenders the breath on the tree in the garden, revealing that if we lose our psyches, we'll find them. <laughs> now, I'll pass out if I keep doing that. Because I'm a closed system, or the two, these two are a closed system. Well, we won't get into all that, but for now, I just want you to notice that life is not holding the breath. It's breathing the breath. And the breath is in the blood. The spirit is in the blood. That's why I would pass out, because I need a tree to turn the carbon dioxide back into oxygen, and the system is just incredibly marvelous and wonderful. But the spirit's in the blood. The spirit, according to Paul, is life. The life is in the blood, but the blood must circulate through all the members of a body, and then like back to the heart, all controlled by the, the brain. You know, my dad died of a lung disease. His lungs literally turned to stone so he could no longer uh, inspire or expire. The last thing I said to him about a half hour before he died, I remember I got down really close to his face and I said, this is his body broken for you, dad. This is his life given for you and to you. And then I remember I said, dad, you don't have to breathe the air on this planet any longer. You get to breathe God in the kingdom of God. And the last thing he said to me was, thank you. You see, his spirit was returning to God. And so he lost his psyche, the, the container for the, for the Zoe, the life, the spirit. And, and then he found it. The spirit is imperishable, but the psyche, the psyche dies and rises again. So think with me real quickly. In, in the beginning, God breathed his breath into a dirt bag so that the, that the Bible calls your nephesh, your psyche, your soul. But at the tree in the garden, you took the life that had already been given as if it were own. So you began to say, my life, myself, my own. You must have been probably about one year old at the time. And then you began to hide the life in fig leaf shame and fear, which you thought was yourself, but was in fact the prison in which your true self was now trapped, you know, like a temple of stone. So you get the picture. Uh, as you come to him, a living stone. You see, a living stone is a psyche that is not self centered for it considers others to somehow be itself and so it gladly gives itself its life away, the life away. As you come to him and he comes to you, the love burns away your flesh and the spirit in him connects with the spirit that was breathed into you in the beginning. That is the spora in you receives the sperma in him or that it actually is him. As Paul writes, you become one spirit with him. That's the most mind-boggling verse in all the Bible to me. You become one spirit with him. You become one breath with him, one spirit with the spirit of love, who is the spirit of the logic of love. And so you freely choose to sacrifice your life for others, even as they begin to sacrifice their life for you, because it's only logical. And although it begins as pain, you know it will soon turn into the supreme pleasure. It is the joy that has been set before you. The same joy that was set before Jesus. You're no longer alone. And it's not good for the Adam to be alone. You've been lost and found in the kingdom of God. The new Jerusalem coming down. The house of God and temple of God. His body. 
So, verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves as living stones, plural, are being, are being, this is what's happening now. You are being built up into a spiritual house, singular, to be a holy priesthood. What do priests do? To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, because it stands, perieko, it's encompassed in Scripture. In other words, this is what Scripture is all about and has been about all about all along. This is why Adam is created in a garden on the Holy mountain. This is why Abraham prepared to sacrifice Isaac on that rock. This is why God led Israel out of slavery to a promised land. This is why the son of David builds the temple, the stone temple, on that very spot. This is why it's destroyed by Babylonians, Romans, and Jews. And this is why he rebuilds it in three days. And this is why the new Jerusalem coming down is everything old may new. And this is why the gates of the city are always open by day. And it is always day in the city. Even if we can't see it for a time because we've trapped ourselves in outer darkness outside the city for we don't know that eternal life is good. Verse 6, for it stands in Scripture. It's a meaning of Scripture. Look, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes upon him will not be put to shame. So the value is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the kephali Ganea, the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock, a petra of offense. They stumble because they disobey, or more literally, they are stumbling because they are disobeying the word, the logos, as they were destined to do. In Paul's words, they were consigned to disobedience. I'm yelling again, sorry. I'm trying not to yell. They were consigned to disobedience. Why would God do that? Romans 11, 32, that he may have mercy on all. Verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You know, the priests, the kings, and, and the prophets were anointed. You're, he's saying you're the anointed. A people for his own possession. Why? So that you can gloat over those that haven't been chosen? Hell no. Hell no. You're chosen that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. To whom would the chosen be proclaiming these excellencies? The unchosen. Who have not yet been chosen to know that they were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. You've been chosen to join Jesus, the anointed, in having mercy on all. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions, the lusts of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. What are the passions of the flesh? (gasps) To hold your breath. To wrap yourselves in fig leaves. Turn your heart into stone forever alone, a a vessel of wrath, a, a temple of stone. And what is the passion of the Christ? Communion with you, his body and bride. In lust, I have lusted to eat this meal with you, says Jesus in the gospel of Luke. His communion of life. Life is literally the sacrifice of the fittest and literally the survival of all that fit and literally the eternal consciousness that all do fit because it is finished and everything is good. That is beautiful. He makes everything beautiful in its time. Verse 12. Keeping your conduct among the unbelievers beautiful. And that's number four. Life is beautiful. Imprisoned in bodies of death, we cannot fully comprehend the life, but the life fully comprehends us, and so we recognize him as beauty. This is the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of beauty. The good. The life is the good. 
And now you know. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of beauty, the good. So unbelievers look at it. They look at this. And unbelievers will say this. Unbelievers will say, that's beautiful. I think he's bleeding for me. Because I just heard him say, Father, forgive them. And I think he understand. We take his life and yet he gives his life. They see beauty. At least until someone comes along and says, no, no, no. He's not bleeding for you. Unless you join our club, obey our rules, and say this prayer. And even then, he's not bleeding for you. He's bleeding for his dad, who is not at all like him. What are we looking at here? We're looking at the revelation of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the revelation of man. The revelation of Adam that is us. We're looking at the foundation stone. We're looking at the head of the body. We're looking at the new Jerusalem touching down. <laughs> and it's coming down. All these slides with the blue dots are from our series on the Revelation. At the end of our study, we realized that the wounds on the body of Christ are the doors of the new Jerusalem. And we are those doors. You know, pearls are wounds that have turned into jewels. So whenever we are wounded, we are being offered the privilege of bleeding the judgment of God, the life of God, who is absolute and relentless love. Or, on the other hand, we can trap ourselves in hell until our fig leaves finally rot and we begin to see that our God will never stop bleeding for us. Verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles beautiful. Now, this is going to be so important when we look at the verses that come next, next week. But keep your conduct among the Gentiles beautiful so that when they speak against you as wrongdoers, they may see your beautiful deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. This summer, I uh, reconnected with my old friend Ted. We have been roommates at CU, and Ted was a groomsman in my wedding it had been decades since I had seen Ted, and I had kind of forgot the details around uh, his son's death. Four and a half years ago, a drunk driver had taken his son's life in a head-on collision, and both of them died on the spot. I knew that it was an unspeakable wound for Ted and Susie when we met them for dinner a few months ago this summer at a friend's house. But as they told us about what happened, they did not seem at all resentful or in the least bit trapped in anger and then Ted said well Peter a friend of ours had a vision a couple weeks ago he sent me the vision and Ted usually watches online so he's part of our body so everyone say hi Ted okay one two three hi Ted and hi Susie <laughs> anyway their friend Kim writes that she learned about Brad's death Brad Dickerson's death online while at work, but she didn't know any of the details. That is, the details of how he had died or uh, where he had died. And so at work, she just started to pray for Ted and, and for Susie. And then she says what suddenly happened, what she experienced as she was sitting at her desk. And now I'll just read. She closed her eyes, she's praying, and, and then this happened. I am aware of a benevolent presence just behind my right shoulder. My eyes are closed, but I am shown a picture and am aware of something that feels like motion. The picture is from an elevated place, perhaps 20 feet above the street. The street is a four-lane road and goes from the top of the frame to the bottom. I slowly recognize that it is Tudor Road with the east direction towards the top and west direction towards the bottom. On the street in the westbound lane are two vehicles which have collided. 
there is a powerful energy not far above us, almost over the mountains to the east, but not quite that far away. It, it is a gold and silver light which has shape but not form. It is like a huge elongated full moon. In scripture, the moon is called the faithful witness, and so is Jesus. A full moon surrounded by clouds or fog. I interpret this phenomenon to be Jesus, and I am told strongly, Jesus is here. That means it's the day of visitation. My focus returns to the vehicles. I see Brad's soul transitioning out of his body. His eyes are wide with a sense of discovery. They are, they are not surprised so much as curious. He feels very in the moment. That's the place where eternity touches time. He is free of pain and worry. He notices Jesus and feels comfortable and excited all at the same time. He feels like he understands what is happening as his soul begins to rise to accompany Jesus. It looks like his soul is expanding and stretching upwards. The colors of red and blue surround him as he begins the ascent. And then she writes this. Brad becomes aware of the other driver in the accident. It is clear to Brad that the other driver is confused. The other driver is passing away but does not know Jesus, nor even know to look for Jesus. It's like his soul is trapped in the vehicle. The other driver cannot recognize that he is passing away, nor that Jesus is there. It is like the other driver's soul is drowning in guilt for what has happened. The other driver is aware that his responsibility in causing the accident is the most heinous of, of acts. From his place in his own ascension, Brad telepathically understands the other driver's emotional state. Brad's heart is filled with compassion, and he immediately and purposefully forgives the driver for causing the accident. Brad is aware that the other driver cannot perceive Jesus directly and knows that he can help show him. As he is moving upwards toward Jesus, Brad extends his hand to the other driver. Not understanding at first, the other driver does not respond. Brad wordlessly comforts him and encourages him to take his hand and to follow. They ascended together. You understand? That other driver encased in, in guilt and shame could not or would not see Jesus. But what did he see? He saw his body broken and bleeding for him, named Brad. Kim then writes, Brad literally helped Jesus save his soul. Well, you don't have to be in a car accident to help Jesus save somebody's soul. You just need to be genuinely kind. I mean, from the heart, because it's your nature, genuinely kind when someone else is unkind to you. And where are you going to find the desire to do that? Where are you going to find the willpower to do that? To freely choose that. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, um, as often as you drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. This is how the members come back together. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he says, um, it is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And he says, and drink of it, all of you. Brown cups are wine. Blue cups are juice. And they contain the spirit of love and the logic of love. Amen. Now with your eyes closed, while you maybe believe the gospel a little bit, and you just pray to God saying, make me more like Jesus, ask the Lord this question. 
is there someone you want me to forgive? Now, if you really want to do damage to the kingdom of hell, just you, 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 and you can pray this silently, pray it however you want out loud, just say after me, in the name of Jesus, I forgive. and say their name. Do you realize that you just released yourself or God just released you from a prison that you thought was yourself? And then Jesus said this crazy thing. Whatever you forgive on earth <laughs> is forgiven in heaven. Wow. So Lord, take all of me. And then lo and behold, you give something back to me. And that's everything. So it turns out that you're good. And the good is the life. And that's what we've been made for. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Brother. And now, I hope you noticed during the sermon that the life is three in one. You notice that? Three in one, in you, in him, always happy. Life is God. And this is the commandment of the Father, said Jesus. Eternal life. Is that cool? So I'm not saying this an invitation. I'm saying this a commandment. This is a commandment from God. Believe the gospel. Amen.